Welcome, everyone. This is amazing. So welcome to the um, Science and Cooking Public Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Pia Sorensen, and I run this with Dave Waits, who is also here. Hi, and, everybody. And today our speaker is Joanne Chang, who is going to uh, take over soon. But I want to say a few words first. And to do that, I'm going to share my screen. So. Um, this lecture series is modeled after the Harvard undergrad class called Science and Cooking, and it is um, organized by the Harvard John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. So we're grateful for their support, and we're also grateful for the support of our sponsors, um, which are listed here on the bottom, which help make this possible. Um, so we have been doing this since 2010. Um, each week we invite a chef and they come and tell us about something that they are really, really excited about. And we basically use it as an opportunity, as inspiration to learn about and to think about science. And for the last 10 years, 11 years, we've been doing this from the Science Center um, at Harvard in Cambridge. And um, it's been a wonderful community that has sort of developed over the years, uh, people from the Boston and Cambridge general public coming together, um, viewing these, these amazing creations by chefs and thinking about science with us. Um, this year we're doing it on Zoom, and which is in a way is sad, but we would not be able to have such an amazing audience from all over the world. So we're really excited to kind of share and expand our community this year. Um, this year, though, we even though we are all over the world, we are uh, sort of virtually going to be in Cambridge. We're joined by Joanne Chang, who is a Boston area legend, and she runs Flower Bakery and Cafe, which is sort of a Boston institution. So for those of you who know it, welcome back and enjoy this virtual tour. And for those of you who are not there, um, th this, is, this is our virtual offering of of Flower Bakery and Cafe. Um, so let's see, I, we have went through the logistics. I think we've said everything we wanna say. We usually start these lectures with a short sort of 15 minute introduction um, about the science to kind of put us in the mindset of the science of the week. And the topic for science this week is phase transitions which may sound fancy, but it, it's, it's also going to be explained in the context of the science of sugar. Um, so I'm going to ask Dave Waits to give us a little bit of background about phase transitions. Okay, so we always introduce this lecture with uh, a little bit of science, the science from our class. Uh, there are certain traditions, we'll tell you what these traditions are uh, for our science. And the first thing we'll talk about is phase transitions. And I'm a physicist, so I always try to think pictorially and graphically and try to understand things. And so the simplest thing that I like to understand is the phase transitions in water. And so here's three different phases of water. That's the solid phase, that's ice, the liquid phase, that's water that you know. And if you boil it, it's gas. And the thing that you change to go from one phase to the other is the temperature. You're increasing the temperature. And there are certain uh, specific temperatures that the material undergoes a phase transition. So at zero degrees centigrade, uh, the ice melts and forms water. At 100 degrees centigrade, the water boils and forms a gas. And these are the phase transitions, and this is the way we describe it as this graphical representation. We get more a little more complicated in, in our uh, class, but this is a good way to understand it. Now really what causes the phase transition from a molecular level? And to see that on the next slide, we have a representation, a, a small movie. And in a minute, okay, we're playing. This is the temperature and you watch the motion of these uh, molecules, they're meant to be water molecules, you see them moving around as the temperature goes up, the red bar shows the temperature, 
you see them move more and more. At first they're in place, now they move around, and now they move all over the place. They fill everywhere. So when they fill everywhere, they become a gas. So there's something that holds them together. Now we're cooling them down. Oh, and look, they're all stuck together. They're adhering to one another. They're stuck, so they're a solid phase, either a, a solid ice or a liquid, depending whether they flow or not. And we can change the temperature. You'll see the temperature go up again, and they'll move around. This is just a simulation. It's just meant to show the different kinds of behavior. It's done by Daniel Rosenberg, who is our guru at uh, demonstrations and things like that in our class. So how do we understand that on a more quantitative basis? Well, on the next slide, we can look at the uh, nature of the um, at the nature of the interactions, and there's something that causes the molecules to interact with one another. There's an energy of interaction, and what we're doing when we're heating things up, when we add heat, we're adding energy, and we characterize this energy. By this quantity, you can see that it depends on the temperature. So if the material is a liquid, then the interaction energy here is much greater than the temperature. So they're moving, but they can't break free. They can't leave one another, still adhere together. And adhesion wins, and they become a condensed phase, a liquid. By contrast, if the temperature gets much larger, then the interaction energy gets small compared to the energy due to the temperature. And then they no longer stick together and they fill all of space. The, the motion that, that the temperature imparts to the molecules is enough that they go everywhere and they become a gas. And so it just depends on what the balance between this interaction energy and this temperature energy. And so we can write that down and we can say right at the boundary, the two are equal. The interaction energy equals the energy due to temperature. And this, in our class, is our equation of the week. And whenever we have equation, we all clap. Show the next click forward, you'll see a hands clapping. Everybody has to clap. So everybody in the audience, please clap your hands whenever we show equation. That's one of the traditions that we have in this class that we have to clap when we have our equation of the week. And even in the public lecture, we expect everybody to clap when we have an equation. And I think, Pia, now you're going to tell us a little bit more about the details. Is that right? Yes, that's right. In, when we teach this class to undergrads, we call this Zoom exercise. It's all the little things you do to stay, to stay awake on Zoom. Um, so this is um, water, right, which is a simple material. And there is this equation that describes right where the phase transition is happening between the gas and the liquid. And as it turns out, um, adding sugar, which of course is sort of the basics of so many desserts, foods, affects this phase boundary. And it affects it both at the ice water interface and the water ice interface. Sorry, the water, the water gas interface. Um, and so adding sugar affects where it happens. And basically, Joanne's lecture is all about how you can modify these phase transitions by adding sugar in varying amounts and sort of working with the material that happens. And so here is a huge bowl of sugar. And for those of you who are chemically inclined and like to look at molecules, in the lower left is a, a sucrose molecule, which is basically table sugar. Um, that's what, what all of this white stuff is made of. And um, what we're going to do next, we're going to, both Dave and I are experimentalists. So we like to try to sort of figure out the world by doing experiments. And we have an experiment planned. And I'm going to maybe just show this next slide first to show. So the question is, so you have a glass of water. And the question is, how much sugar can you really dissolve and add into the water without there being sugar left on the bottom? And similarly, if you were to do the same thing with salt, could, could you add as much or less? Or, or, or how do the two compare? So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, Dave is going to actually do the experiment for us. Is that right, Dave? Yes, I'm, I'm 
at heart just an experimentalist. I love doing experiments. Okay, so I have 200 grams. I've measured this before. 200 grams of water in two jars, and I have 200 grams of sugar here and 200 grams of salt here. And I'm going to mix them together. So let me salt, start with the salt. I'm going to add the salt to the water and see how much dissolves in the water. That's a lot of salt, Dave. Is that really That's enough? a lot of salt indeed, Pia. Let me stir it here. Stir it really well. And then while it tries to mix, I'm going to take the same 200 grams of water and 200 grams of sugar. I've measured this out in advance. I'm going to add the sugar to the water. So I encourage the volume, you. I notice the volume of the sugar was actually a little more than the volume of the salt. And now this I'll mix it. So I'll do a bet. This is where you bet with the person you're, you're doing this with. Is the sugar going to dissolve? Is the salt going to dissolve? Are they both going to dissolve? And this is when this is when you do the bet. We'll find out soon. Okay, let's have a look. The sugar, it's not all dissolved, but it's almost all dissolved. So I just see a little bit at the bottom, but there's pretty little sugar left. It's almost all dissolved. I think if I held my hand and just warm the water, I just took it from the sink, it's a little chilly, but it's pretty much all dissolved. So it dissolved the same weight of sugar as the weight of water. But the salt, now there's a huge amount of salt. Can you see that? There's a huge amount of salt at the bottom of this jar. Let me see if I can hold it up. You see the undissolved salt here. There's a large amount of salt in the water. So water dissolves sugar at a much higher amount than it dissolves salt. You can easily dissolve more than the weight of water with sugar, whereas salt, you can't get anywhere near the amount of, wa of uh, water, of uh, the weight of water. Okay, Pia, I'm going to unshare my screen and let you take over. Thank okay. you for letting me do the experiment. No, thank no, you. So thank you for doing an experiment with us. So um, now you should all see, so this is the experiment we did. And I mean, so Dave kind of said this, but let me just repeat what, what he said. Did you see how much sugar he was able to dissolve? And do any of you, I mean, the question is like, how much could you, if you really, really pushed it and you were willing to wait and stir, how much could you dissolve? And you can think to yourself what you think the answer would be, but it turns out that at room temperature, the solubility limit of sugar is two grams for every one gram of water. So that means if you take 200 grams of sugar, you can dissolve it in 100 grams of water. Whereas for salt, the solubility limit is much, much lower. It's only 0.3 grams. So Dave could have kept going and we could just have waited for him to add just as much sugar and just kept stirring and eventually it would all have dissolved. So I think this is crazy, um, but it turns out that it gets even worse. So as you then, if you were to then heat this concentration, so here I'm, I'm showing you um, on the y-axis is the solubility of gram sucrose in gram water, and on the x-axis is the temperature. And so at room temperature, which is here in the corner, 20 degrees Celsius, um, the solubility is about two to one. But if you then increase the temperature slowly, over time, you can dissolve more and more sugar. And at 100 degrees Celsius, which is kind of cut off here, but at 100 degrees Celsius, you can dissolve 4.5 grams for every one gram of water. That's a lot of sugar per, per, per water. And what's interesting about this is that as you increase the temperature, 
not only can you get more and more sugar in there, but the actual boiling point of that elevation is no longer 100 degrees, which it is when there is zero sugar. So this is sugar by percent weight on the x-axis. When there is zero sugar, the boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius, right? Then as you increase the percentage of sugar, the boiling point goes up a lot, and it goes up to, to 150 degrees Celsius. And that is basically the magic and the science behind almost everything that Joanne is going to do. So with that, I'm going to um, stop showing, sharing graphs with you, and I'm going to introduce Joanne, who is our speaker. Um, Joanne has been with us for many years now. And what you're about to watch is really, I would say, a real science and cooking classic. Um, Joanne has been joining us for many years and she always teaches us new things and she brings up questions and brings her curiosity. Um, and there's always drama to her lectures because all the demos need to work out on time and you'll see what happens. Um, Joanne is the author of several books. Um, she runs Flower Baker and Cafe and Myerson Chang. Um, I think in the chat, there's going to be a link to some of her books. The most recent one is Pastry Love, um, which is on, on, her, on her website. Um, there's also going to be a link to our new book, which Joanne was generous enough to submit a recipe to. So you can go and read about even more about the science and sugar in that book. And all of those links are going to show up in, in the chat. And um, so if you were an undergrad in this class, you, we would basically make you go and do hands-on experiments in your kitchens. Well, normally it would be in a, in, a, in a lab, but this year it would be in a kitchen. And so what you can do um, is you can click on one of the links and Joanne is offering kits where you can get all the ingredients sent to you and you can actually do some hands-on education yourself in your kitchen, which is basically your, your home laboratory. And you can, you can do all of these things at home. So um, I think with that, let's all join and welcome our very own Joanne Chang. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Professor Weitz. Hi, Pia. Hi, Patricia. Thank you so much for having me. This is always such an honor. Um, this is, we were talking right before we all got on, I think this might be my ninth class, either my eighth class or my ninth class. Um, and every time I teach this, it is a thrill and an honor. Um, obviously, this year is a little bit different. It's a little bit unusual, but um, still really fun. And I'm thrilled that we've got 1,700 people. And then I'm also, um, live streaming this on Instagram Live, hoping that everybody who follows me on Instagram can also watch the class if they couldn't um, see the Zoom link. Uh, so we're gonna spend the next 30 minutes or so talking about sugar. Um, as Pia said, there's a little bit of drama involved. It's very dramatic on my part because I'm always trying to get the timing just right for everything uh, because we wanna show different things that you can do with sugar. Um, so if there's some waiting time, um, I know that there will be questions that are coming through. And so uh, P and I will be um, answering all of the questions as well. But the purpose of tonight is just to share with you some of the fascinating science of sugar and baking um, and to get your interest peaked in this, uh, in this subject matter. And hopefully it'll get you baking and learning a little bit more about science. Um, okay, so let's get started. Pia, if you could share um, the video or the... the your screen, we have a little PowerPoint presentation that we're going to present to all of you. There we go. Okay, great. The science of sugar. So about uh, 13 years ago in 2007, uh, I was asked to be, uh, I was asked to film the pilot episode of a new Food Network show called The Science of Sweets, very similar to this class. Um, they reached out to me and said, we are interested in showing off the science of sweets and we would like you to film the pilot episode. So they brought me to a green room, a hotel in Cambridge, and they had me, uh, you saw I was 
taking a, a protractor. They had me write out the Fibonacci sequence. Um, they had me talk about um, uh, pi. I can recite pi to 50, degree, 50 digits, and so they had me do that. The whole time I'm thinking to myself, I'm not sure that a protractor or the Fibonacci sequence or any of this has to do with science and cooking and baking, but you know what? They're the TV professionals. I'm gonna let them just guide me on what to do. So that was the first day. Um, on the second day, they had me actually making sticky buns. And I was making sticky buns. Um, and I was, you can see that this was at our second bakery in uh, Fort Point Channel. Uh, we had actually just opened our second flour bakery and I was making sticky buns for this show that I thought was gonna be the science of sweets. Uh oh, where'd it go? Okay, hold on one sec. I wanna make this video go. And... There we go. So I'm making sticky buns and all of a sudden Bobby Flay walks in. Now I was shocked because I thought we were filming the science of sweets, but he said, no, I'm challenging you to a throwdown. Now I couldn't believe it. I said, what are you talking about? This is my show, the science of sweets. But it turns out that for two days he had been prepping to uh, challenge me to a throwdown in sticky buns. Now, uh, I was, I had no idea this was happening. I was totally floored. It is all blind. You have no idea that this is actually going to be happening. Um, and so you can see I'm kind of, I'm like really confused. I'm like, really, is this what's happening? But it turns out um, that he made a pretty darn good sticky bun, but I'm thrilled to say that ours won. And it is not staged. People ask me all the time if I knew that we were gonna win, but we didn't know at all. Um, so I was bummed that there was no show, The Science of Sweets, but of course I was really happy that we did win the throwdown. Now, if I had been able to film the, uh, the, the Science of Sweets, I think the first episode I would have wanted to film would have been about sugar. And in fact, I am so fascinated by how sugar and baking intersect that I actually wrote a book called Baking with Less Sugar, where I talk about the impact of sugar in baking. Uh, sugar, so here's some desserts from that book. So it turns out, and this shouldn't be a surprise to all of you, but sugar uh, is something that we as humans are engineered to love. If you give babies something sweet, they automatically gravitate towards it and smile. It brings them pleasure. Um, and they feel safe. The opposite of that is something that's sour or bitter. If you hand a baby something sour or bitter, it indicates danger, and so they shy away from it. Sugar is such a huge part of our lives that think about how you ended your dinner tonight. Probably you had something sweet. Now you may have had fruit, very sweet. Some people I saw that there were some people from all over uh, different parts of the world. So in some many places, people actually end a meal with cheese. Not me. I don't view that as some, a way that I want to end a meal. I want something sweet. And in fact, when I think about how I end my meals, I want to end with something that is made with sugar. So here are a bunch of different desserts um, that we make at Flower Bakery. And this is how we end meals. Um, with something uh, that's made with sugar. Now take a moment and ask yourself, what is the importance of sugar in desserts? You may think that the main purpose of sugar is to simply add sweetness. So we're gonna put a couple of polls up and ask you all um, if you can figure out which of these foods is sugar only there to make it sweet. So here's the question. For which of the following foods does sugar only make the food sweet? Cookies, jello, candies, sponge cake, or none of the above? So if you want to go ahead and click on which one you think that is, of these four desserts, one of them has, they all have sugar in them, and in one of the desserts, the only reason you have the sugar there is to make it sweet, in the other desserts, the sugar is there to make the dessert sweet, but it also has another reason. Okay, let's see what everybody 
aha, 40, like we got 3% cookies, 43% jello, 13% candy, 3% sponge cake, and 38% none of the above. So the answer is jello. When you make jello, the sugar is just to make it sweet. In all of the other three items, you actually need the sugar for things other than just sweetness. So we'll do this again. We have another uh, poll. Which of these foods is the sugar, the sugar's only role to add sweetness? We have another poll coming up. Here it comes. Or maybe not. <laughs> okay, here we go. For which of the following foods does sugar only make the food sweet? Ice cream, sugar cookie, birthday cake, cheesecake. So what is, which one of these desserts does sugar play a, the singular role of making it sweet and doesn't do anything else to the dessert? Go ahead and take your cursor and select which dessert you think has sugar in it just for the sweetness and not for other things. Okay, and the answers are ice cream, 44%. 7% sugar cookie, 3% birthday cake, and 51% cheesecake. You guys are good. So a lot of you picked ice cream, but that is not correct. Sugar cookie, birthday cake are not correct. It is cheesecake. For ice cream, sugar cookie, and birthday cake, sugar not only adds sweetness, but also does some other things, which we will go into in this lecture. And one last poll. Let's see if you all are starting to catch on. For which of the following foods does sugar only make the food sweet? Chocolate, Oreos, meringue cookies, or taffy? So again, that's chocolate, Oreos, meringue cookies, or taffy. Which one of these has sugar in it and the only thing the sugar is doing is simply just making it sweet and not anything else? And the answers are chocolate, 63%, Oreos, 9%, meringue cookies, 17%, and taffy, 12%. Excellent. I think if this were a test, you all would pass, pass with flying colors on this Harvard class. Wonderful. Okay. So we are going to talk about all of the ways that sugar makes that birthday cake that you love so much so good. And it's not just to add sweetness. So here, here's actually the uh, examples of these in these desserts, these desserts have sugar in them, and the only thing the sugar is doing is adding sweetness, and that's it. So let's go to what sugar does to your desserts. So why do I have a picture of a gardener here? Well, the first thing that is really important um, that sugar does is sugar actually lightens and adds fluffiness to cakes and to cookies. And it does that by an action that's called creaming. Creaming uh, butter and sugar together is sort of like after the winter when the ground is totally cold and hard and you take a garden hoe and you actually try to aerate the, the dirt so that you can plant your flowers. When you are putting butter and sugar together, imagine the sugar, all of the little tiny sugar crystals. Um, the, the sugar is actually a crystal. If you take it into a microscope and look at each little sugar crystal, you see that it's a little, little bitty crystal. Those sugar crystals are going into the butter and acting just like this garden hoe. They are aerating the butter. They are creating millions and millions of microscopic air bubbles within that butter. In fact, to the point where if you take a look at butter and sugar before creaming and after, you can see that the before creaming is a little clumpy, lumpy, and a little bit yellow and afterwards it gets brighter, whiter, and it's fluffier. And this is because it's been aerated. And in fact, the action of creaming butter, butter and sugar together, which is a very common baking action, um, is so named because it gets so light that it looks like cream. Now, why is that important? Well, when you are making a cake or a cookie, when you fold in into this butter and sugar mixture, when you fold in flour and you fold in eggs and you fold in you know, some flavorings, when you put the cake batter into the oven, 
what happens is that the oven heat causes all of the liquid that's in your cake batter to turn to steam. And when the steam is created within the cake batter, the steam actually takes every single one of those microscopic little air bubbles that you created with the, uh, with the creaming of the sugar and the butter, and it makes the air bubble just a little bit bigger. And if you see, if you imagine that, you can look at what we did was we actually baked two cakes. I'm, I'm sure you can guess now which, which one of these cakes is made with uh, butter that is creamed versus butter, uh, butter and sugar that are creamed together versus butter and sugar that are not. And you can see that this cake right here is on the left is the cake that was not made with butter and sugar that were creamed. And the cake on the right is on the top is made with butter and sugar that are creamed. And you can see the difference if you take a look at the bottom two pictures. So it's flip flop, but the left cake um, on the screen this cake was made with butter and sugar that were creamed for about 10 minutes. So we spent a lot of time creaming the butter and sugar together, making it really light and airy. So when that cake batter went into the oven, it rose because there were so many air bubbles already in the cake batter. And then the heat caused the liquid from the milk and the eggs to turn to steam and expand the cake. And you can see that you have this really light fluffy crumb versus the other cake, which looks really awful and looks like nothing we would ever want to eat. And in this one, the butter and sugar were not creamed together. And so there were no, none of those air bubbles. And so when the batter goes into the oven, it just kind of sinks and it gets kind of leaden and rubbery. So that's a hugely important um, way in which sugar is uh, reacts with baked goods. It's not just making your birthday cake sweet, it's actually making it light and fluffy. So what's another way, um, another thing that sugar does in baking? Oh, here's a section, there's an example of the bad cake and the good cake. Okay, another thing that sugar um, does for baking is sugar is what's called hygroscopic. And what that means is that sugar grabs all of the moisture that's in the air. It grabs it and grabs it and brings it into whatever, uh, whatever it is mixed into. And so this Entman's cake can sit on these shelves at the Shaw supermarket for weeks and weeks at a time and stay moist in part, well, one, it's got a lot of stuff in there like preservatives to make it do that, but also because it, is, it has so much sugar in it that it's taking all of the moisture that it, that's, it can in the air and bringing it into the cake. And so when you have sugar in a baked good, it actually helps keep the baked good moist so that you can continue to enjoy that cookie or that cake for a couple of days after you've made it. Um, I mentioned that I wrote a book, Baking with Less Sugar. Um, all of the recipes in that book are delicious and uh, they are all made with less sugar. And after the book came out, I wanted to actually add some of these recipes to the uh, pastry counter at Flower Bakery. But unfortunately, what we found out is because for example, the coffee cake, it has a lot less sugar. It meant that after about six hours of sitting out on the counter, it got really dry. And so sugar's role is so important to keep a baked good moist. Okay, so now what else does sugar do? Sugar lowers the freezing point of liquid. So for those of you who uh, are watching who are in the New England area, or, or I saw somebody from Denver, Colorado, or if you're in any area where there's a lot of snow, um, what happens when the roads are covered in snow? What, what actually uh, allows you to drive on these roads? You see the plows and they're going out, and a lot of times they're sprinkling salt all over the snow and all over the roads. And why are they doing that? Well, salt actually lowers the freezing point of snow, of ice. And so uh, you would think that at 32 degrees, you take some snow out there, it's gonna stay frozen solid and you're gonna slip and slide when you're driving around. If you sprinkle salt on it, the freezing point lowers. Maybe it lowers to 20 degrees or even 15 degrees. And that allows the snow to melt so that you can drive to work. Sugar does the exact same thing. Sugar lowers the freezing point of uh, ice creams and sorbets. So I'm gonna show you this video. Let me see if I can do. 
So we made four, it's either four or five different grapefruit sorbets. This first one is made with no sugar. So this is just grapefruit juice, a little bit of water, and you can see from the video that it's hard and icy. There's no way you would wanna eat that. In this version, we actually added half a cup of sugar. It's a little bit easier to spoon, but it's still kind of hard. And again, it's not necessarily something that you would want to eat. You certainly wouldn't pay, pay money for it. Then we have version three with one cup of sugar. And now you can see that the spoon actually spoons right through the sorbet. Version four, we added one and a half cups of sugar. And you can actually see that it's starting to melt a little bit. Like it's the, the freezing point is so low that the grapefruit doesn't even doesn't even stay frozen. And then this is two cups of sugar. And now it's just a slush. So you can make your, your sorbet or your ice cream creamy or less creamy, depending on how much sugar you add to it. Um, when I was writing Baking with Less Sugar, one of the things I wanted to do was include some sorbets and ice creams. But because this book was meant to reduce the amount of sugar in pastries, I had to come up with another way to make these ice creams and sorbets palatable because like the grapefruit sorbet, um, the first couple of experiments that I did, they were so hard that you couldn't serve them. I mean, I remember making a chocolate ice cream, uh, but it had very, very little sugar. Um, the flavor was good, but then as soon as I put it in the freezer, it froze rock solid. And so there was no way I could include this in the book. And there was certainly no way I would ever serve this um, to anybody. So I had to figure out, gosh, if I've, I've taken out the sugar in this ice cream, how can I make it uh, actually creamy enough to eat? So um, I talked about how salt lowers the freezing point of frozen desserts. Sugar lowers the freezing point. I, but I didn't want to add a lot of salt. You wouldn't want a salty uh, chocolate ice cream. Um, sugar lowers the freezing point of desserts, but I didn't want to add sugar because the whole point of the book um, was to bake with less sugar. So uh, the, the other thing that actually reduces the freezing point is alcohol. So instead of just chocolate ice cream made with very, very little sugar, I made a chocolate bourbon ice cream. So there's a lot of things that you can do to try to reduce the freezing point of your frozen dessert to make it um, really smooth and creamy. So that's a really important thing. Um, uh, in terms of desserts, using sugar to help you modulate the texture of um, a sorbet or a parfait or anything that's gonna go into the freezer, you know that by adding sugar to it, it's gonna make it softer. Okay, now, what's another thing that sugar does? Well, sugar stabilizes beaten egg foams. So here's a couple of desserts that are made with um, egg foams. And when I talk about egg foams, um, what I mean is egg whites that are beaten uh, until they're aerated. Um, so lemon meringue pie, for example, is simply egg whites mixed with sugar and, uh, and then baked on top of the pie. The same with the angel food cake. You take egg whites and you mix them with the sugar and then you fold in some cake flour and you bake it into a cake. Um, and then buttercream, which I'll show you in a little bit, we take sugar, um, we actually cook it, and then we mix it into egg whites, and that um, causes the egg white foam to stabilize. So we're gonna um, stop right now and go to the kitchen. Okay, here we go. Oh shoot, I forgot my Instagram friends. Instagram friends, are you still there? Um, okay, you're gonna watch there. You're gonna watch here. So this is my trusty mixer and I have some egg whites. I'm going to put the egg whites in the mixer. It's gonna be loud. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm beating up the egg whites with the whisk attachment. And so you saw it before, it was yellow and viscous. I always think it looks like snot, it's very snotty. Uh, let's see. Can you see? Okay. Now you can see that it's starting to aerate and foam.
Okay, so remember the point of um, this demonstration is to show you that sugar stabilizes the egg foam. So this was just egg whites. Just like that. No sugar whatsoever. So see, kind of foamy, but it's um, not stable yet. But you, you'll see in like, at the end of the lecture, I'm gonna show you what it looks like. Now we're gonna do the exact same thing. This is the exact same um, sugar, I mean, sorry, this is the exact same egg whites, okay? It's gonna get loud again. Okay, so we're beating up the egg whites again, but this time we're going to add some sugar and we're going to compare the two foams. Okay. So I'm adding sugar to the foam. I think in the haste of everything, I added the sugar too fast, so it's gonna take a little while. But essentially, this is the first foam, whoa. And at the end of the lecture, what you'll see is that even though it's all foamy on top, it's very unstable and all of the, not all, but a lot of the water from the egg whites is gonna fall to the bottom. Whereas the other, the other meringue with the, with the sugar, the sugar, so let me explain what sugar does. Egg, egg whites are just protein strands, mostly. Protein strands and water. So if you've ever had like an egg white omelet, uh, you know that um, a lot of people eat egg white omelets because it's just protein, there's no fat in there. So egg whites are lots of protein strands mixed with a lot of water. And when you mix it up in a mixer, what's happening is the egg white protein strands are starting to latch onto each other. The, the action of the whisk actually like stretches out these strands that are in the egg whites. And then they start to kind of hook up onto each other. Sort of like, um, you know, if you have like a bunch of rubber bands in your bag and by the end of the day, they're all kind of like twisted and they've all connected to each other and you can take out and you've got like a, a mass of rubber bands, right? If you just threw a bunch of rubber bands in your bag and just went around all day long, by the time you got home, a lot of them would have started to kind of twist and turn and, and connect to each other. That's exactly what happens when you take egg whites and you put them in a mixer. They start to connect to each other. And as they connect, they start to stretch and the whisk is uh, the whip is stretching them and stretching them and then these egg whites that have no sugar what happens is after a while they the protein strands just start to collapse and then all of the water that's in egg whites just kind of leaches out 
But when you add sugar, the sugar actually mixes with the water that's in the egg whites. The sugar is creating a sugar syrup right now that is mixing with the, the sugar is mixing with the water that's in the egg whites and it's forming like this little protective barrier around all of those little air bubbles that were created by the egg white uh, rubber bands that were all connected together. So like if you imagine, like if you're shipping something um, really fragile across the country, you're gonna put it in a big box and you're gonna put packing peanuts all around it to keep it from like shifting around and, and popping or breaking. And that's exactly what the sugar is doing with the meringue is that it's basically creating like a mesh of packing peanuts all around all the air bubbles to make it stable. Okay, let's go look at it. Oh gosh, that is the loudest thing in the world. Okay. So the difference, hopefully you can see it. I don't know if you can. Hmm. Aha, here we go. So this meringue is, Wow, beautiful. This is like the best, fluffiest, almost like marshmallows. Oh my gosh, it looks so good. Okay, so this now is the exact same amount of egg whites that the other one was, but we added some sugar. And again, the sugar mixed with the water that's in the egg whites, and it created this really beautiful meringue. And I'm gonna see if you can, oh, sorry, you guys can't see. So can you see that? Can you see that? So that's that one and that's this one. Okay, we're gonna look at these again at the end of the lecture, okay? Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Um. sort of the timing of this whole thing happens. So I'm gonna get some sugar going. We're gonna all cross our fingers and hope. Okay, what else does sugar do? Sugar aids in browning. I'm gonna show you pictures of two coffee cakes. Oh, sorry. I feel like I've got two kids. There you go. And there you go. The coffee cake on the left, this one, this one, is our coffee cake from Flower Bakery. It's made with a healthy amount of sugar, it's delicious, and it's golden brown. The coffee cake on the right is from Baking with Less Sugar. Uh, it's made with about a third, I think it might even be a quarter of the amount of sugar that's in the other coffee cake, and you can see the difference. And in fact, when we were taking pictures for this book, all of the, uh, oh, that's right, I have to, hold on, no. All of the pictures of every baked good came out really pale and insipid looking. And the publisher said, my gosh, we certainly can't print these. Uh, and I said, well, and they wanted to um, Photoshop them. But I said, no, what we have to do is show the, the pastries exactly as they are. Because if you don't have sugar, or if you have a little amount of sugar, then the baked good is not as brown. Um, there's a Maillard reaction, which happens when sugars are heated up and it produces all these new molecules that not only add color but flavor. So that's a big important factor uh, in baking with sugar. It adds beautiful color to your baked goods. Um, okay, and then we have, oops, how do I do this? Another thing, let's see, stop remote control. Yeah, if you could move it one more. I can't seem to make it move forward. Perfect, and then again, there. So sugar tenderizes and inhibits gluten development. So here's a beautiful loaf of bread. Um, bread has that gorgeous, open, airy structure because the, hold on, I'm gonna turn down some of this stuff that's going on back here. Okay, so bread has this gorgeous, airy structure because there's gluten in here. Um, and then on the right is a fluffy cake, fluffy yellow birthday cake. Now, when you eat bread, you want something that's chewy. 
you want gluten to, to be developed. What is gluten? Gluten are protein strands that are, exist in flour. So this is different from the protein um, that's in egg whites. This is uh, two different protein strands in flour. One is called glutenin and the other is called gliadin. This is in all wheat flour. All wheat flour contains glutenin and gliadin. Glutenin and gliadin are activated when they come in contact with water. Water acts like a magnet to the glutenin and the gliadin, and it causes them to hook onto each other and create more of those bubbles, very similar to what we were talking about with the egg whites. Um, but in this case, it is with uh, flour, and it creates all of these gluten strands. So imagine if you take uh, flour and mix it with water just a big bowl of flour and just pour some water in it. If you mix it and mix it and mix it and mix it, eventually it starts to get a little stretchy, right? And you can imagine that you've got this like little stretchy dough ball. What's happening is that you're creating gluten in the flour, in the dough. And when you're making bread, that's a great thing because you put that dough in the oven and you would also mix some yeast in there and the yeasts are gonna cause the dough to actually expand and take all of those gluten strands and expand them into big bubbles. And that's how you get this really beautiful open crumb that's in the bread. However, if you're making a cake, the last thing in the world you want is a chewy, tough cake. So what sugar does, remember we're talking about how does sugar help with baking other than causing adding sweetness. What sugar does is sugar actually acts as a barrier between the glutenin and gliadin. So when you're mixing a cake batter and you add sugar into the cake batter, it is causing the gluten and gliadin to repel from each other so that when you add milk and then eggs and uh, you know, vanilla or whatever to your, to your cake, you, you don't develop the gluten because the sugar tenderizes and pre pre prevents the gluten from developing. So that's a very, very important role that sugar plays um, in baking. Okay, and then finally, uh, let's see if I can move it. Nope, Pia, I'm gonna need your help, please. Sugar makes pastries crispy. So this is sugar that's been cooked to caramel. Um, and uh, if you, and then the next picture is some sugar cookies. Uh, so every time we do this lecture in person, I wish we were all in person, although there's 1,700 people. I don't know if we could produce that many cookies, but we've always given away a little um, sugar cookie to show you what sugar does with cookies. The sugar that's in cookies, um, besides the creaming, which we talked about uh, a little while ago, the sugar, once it goes into the oven, it starts to caramelize. And then when it cools down, um, it causes your cookie to be nice and crispy. And so that's a really great attribute to a good cookie. So that's crispy on the outside and soft on the inside. Great, so those are kind of seven things that sugar does. Um, now we're gonna go through the stages of sugar. So the first stage is what's called um, thread stage. Uh, and what this means is if I take sugar and I mix it with water, and then I heat it to 230 to 235 degrees, it basically doesn't do anything, it just acts like a little, um, the, the, the only thing you can really do with sugar at this point is mix it into iced tea. So, but we call it thread stage. If you take sugar, um, Pia, you can move forward, I think to, yeah. So thread stage is just sugar that uh, has been mixed. Exactly, move on. Okay, and then the second stage is softball stage. Now this is when you take sugar, this is sugar and water together, and I actually have it going behind me, sugar and water together. When you bring it up to about 238 degrees, at that point, if you mix it into, uh, into some cold water, it'll form a little soft ball. And what is this good for? Well, when you have sugar at this stage, when you put it into some cold water and it turns into a soft ball, you can actually make fudge and you can make Italian meringue, which is what I'm trying to do back here. I'm watching all these different pots of sugar going. Now, if you keep the sugar boiling, it'll continue to rise in temperature. And the next stage is called firm ball stage. And with firm ball stage, you can make, so this is when you take the sugar water, you bring it to 248 degrees, 
you actually, you can measure it with a thermometer or you can actually take a little bit of it and put it in some ice. What you can make with that is marshmallows, nougat, and even rock candy. Keep cooking the sugar. Keep cooking it, keep cooking it. And the next stage, oh, hardball, sorry, I, I skipped a step. So hardball stage, uh, 252 or so. And then that's where you get um, uh, nougat and rock candy. That's nougat. The next stage is soft crack. And you take it even further to about 270 degrees. And this is what, uh, using this sugar syrup, when it's reached 270 degrees, then it actually, when you put it in some ice water, it, it turns into threads that are flexible. They don't crack, but they are, um, uh, but it's not a ball. It actually starts to thread out. And that's what you use to make uh, toffee and butterscotch. And then we go to hard crack stage. This is as you continue to cook it and it goes up to 300 degrees. And this is what you use to make nut brittles, which we're gonna make, and also hard candies. And then finally, if you keep cooking the sugar, it will start to caramelize. Um, and that's when it starts to turn brown. And we are going to actually do a couple of things with caramel. Okay, I think that's the, yes, that's that. So now we're going to try and cook things. But this is gonna be tricky. So I'm gonna show you. Um, I have three different pots of sugar going and the first one is this one and in this one let me get the mixer going again so hold on one sec everybody we're gonna go back everybody there hi we're gonna go back to the mixer Egg whites, same old egg whites as last time. This sugar, I'm gonna to try to bring it to what's called softball, right? We just talked about, this was just sugar and water mixed together. I'm taking my finger, I'm putting it in some ice water and I'm gonna scoop a little bit of this. Ooh, there we go, ooh, this is good. Okay, and now I'm gonna to try to show you, where's the camera? Can you see that? That is the sugar that has been cooked. Oops, where'd it go? That is the sugar that has been cooked to soft ball. So now I take the sugar and I stream it into the egg whites. While that's going, I have two more pots of sugar. This one, you see that? It's caramelizing. It's both caramelizing. Okay, now we're going to make praline. I have toasted almonds. I have sugar that's been cooked to caramel. Okay. So now I'm gonna take these almonds and I'm gonna throw them into this sugar. I'm gonna swirl it around.
Okay. And then hopefully you can see the praline. So this is sugar that was cooked to 300, at least 300 degrees, probably more like 320, 340. That's why it's got this golden brown sheen. And then I mixed in some nuts. I'm just gonna let this cool. And as soon as this cools, it's gonna become nut brittle. Go to the side. I'm gonna show you the two meringues that we made just a couple minutes ago, just so you can see. This one is the one where we added a lot of sugars. You see how stable it is? Oops, can you see that? Hold on, I'm gonna give it a... Yeah. You can see it's still creamy, beautiful. You still wanna eat it. And then this was the egg whites that didn't have any. Oh my gosh. Can, can you see that here? I'm gonna, hold on one sec. Look at all of the water that is gonna come out of here. Look at that. Can you believe that? That's insane. That's all of the water and the egg whites because we didn't have any sugar to stabilize that foam. Let's go back to the other one. This is the one. Nothing, right? Nothing. It's all creamy and beautiful. Okay, and now our last Our last thing is we're going to make spun sugar. This is what's called a croquembouche. It's a tower of cream puffs and it is a very, um, it's actually a, a wedding cake, a popular wedding cake in France. So what we're gonna do for all of you who saw the ad for this Class, you saw that beautiful croquem bush, which was covered in sponge sugar. This is car this is sugar that I cooked until it started to just turn caramel color, and yeah. And now I'm just waiting it for it to cool a little bit, because as it cools, it thickens, and then. Was getting too loud. Okay, now I'm going to show you how to spin the sugar. You take the sugar and it comes off of the, the offset spatula and then you just flick it back and forth and the sugar falls in these beautiful threads and it looks like uh, I mean, it just looks so pretty. So you just have to be really patient because you gotta cook the sugar until it reaches at least 300 degrees. It's gotta reach that hard crack stage. It doesn't have to color, but usually it starts to color. Um, and then you let it cool. And then you just take your spoon or offset spatula or something and you just flick it back and forth and back and forth. And you can see you start to create this beautiful spun sugar cage out of the threads that, that result. I don't know how well you guys can see this, but I'm gonna keep going just for a little bit so you can see. Can you see? Pia, can you see? Yeah, I can, I can see it. Um, I'm not sure we see your hand movement. I think we want to see what, what you do there with your hand because it comes down so beautifully. Okay, here, then you can see the top. So, how do I do this? <laughs> yeah, how about this? Yes. Can you see? Yeah. Perfect.
Yeah. So you just have to take your wrist and flick really quickly. Um, sometimes I see people, okay, I'm gonna show you what not to do. Don't do this. You don't wanna do this. I mean, you can, but you're not gonna get really pretty threads. Instead, you wanna hold it up, let some of the sugar run off, and then you wanna flick back and forth like this. Boop, 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 boop. And it just falls off and it makes this beautiful, I mean, it's so pretty, right? Can you bring some of that up to the camera? Yeah. Look at that. Wow, gorgeous. Yes. Yes. And then as the sugar cools, um, it starts to get thicker and thicker. And you can um, do what's called pulled sugar, where you take the sugar and you actually like, it gets really stiff and you can pull it. And that's when people make like sugar flowers and sugar sculptures and all that, which I don't know how to do, but I know how to do this sponge sugar, which I think is really beautiful. That's gorgeous. Wow. Beautiful, Joanne. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And it's funny because I have some questions right away that are wondering if you got sugar all over the place and if there is sponge sugar all over your computer now. Um, I'm wondering if that question is coming from my husband, who's probably watching. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is sugar all over. However, um, the good thing about sugar is it's very easy to clean. And so now I have pots of sugar everywhere, but to clean all of these caramelized pots, you just have to um, fill the pots with water. You can just let it soak overnight, or you can bring it back up to a boil, and it'll just mix in and boil away. Oh, and then I forgot we, we did have the praline. So this is that praline that I made, and it is now, as it cools, it's still too warm. But you can see it's starting to come off. But it's too, it's too hot. We gotta wait for it to cool. Okay. Wow, that's fantastic. And we did it, everything just came together perfectly. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I think all of us are clapping in our, our loneliness. <laughs> and there are some questions for you, if you're ready. Ready. Okay. So I'll sort of start a little bit from the beginning, because we had some questions about the creaming. Um, yes. And s someone asked, Allegrita asked, can you overmix the sugar and butter? And another question was, does it matter what kind of sugar you use? So those are kind of connected, I think. Yes. So from my experience, uh, uh, overmix is if you beat it for so long that the sugar ends up melting the butter and then you don't, you don't have the ability to create all those air pockets because the butter starts to melt. So um, we cream the butter and sugar together anywhere from five to 10 minutes. You can keep it going, but you just have to keep an eye on the uh, butter sugar and make sure it doesn't get too warm. And in terms of does the sugar type of sugar matter, um, you can't use, for example, confectioner's sugar to get the same amount of volume and lightness because confectioner's sugar, the sugar crystals are ground so fine, you know, that's um, powdered sugar, it's like powder. Uh, it doesn't actually have the same, uh, same effect on the butter because the sugar crystals are so fine. But you can use, um, you can certainly use brown sugar is, um, it still has the sugar crystals, anything that has a crystalline structure so that it can do that thing like the garden hoe does. So it can go into the butter and just really like aerate it. Okay, great. Someone is asking, what about using stevia as a substitute for sugar? I'll be honest, I have never experimented with artificial sugars. So I, I feel like next year I need to, before I do this class, I should try. And, experiment a little bit, but I've never played around with artificial sugars. Um, you know, when I wrote Baking with Less Sugar, we definitely thought about that. Should we create a whole chapter for desserts made with artificial sweeteners? And instead we decided to just go the natural sugar route. We did things with honey, with maple syrup, fruit juices. We reduced the amount of sugar, um, but I never actually uh, baked with stevia or anything else like that. Yeah, should I help you ask some of the questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's a question, a good question, uh, Joanne. Yes. Why do the egg whites turn white when you beat them? 
when they're yellow to start with? So from what I understand, so they're, they're yellow because it's just these protein globules that just exist in egg whites. And as soon as you take a whisk to them, um, like I was explaining earlier, the protein strands start to hook on to each other and then they foam. I mean, they, they create air bubbles and they just foam. And as they continue to foam, uh, you get more and more and more of these air bubbles and it's no longer globs of proteins and instead it's bubbles of proteins. And so if you think about anything that bubbles and foams, like even um, like if you go to the sea and you see the, the waves crash up, all of the, the, the foaminess it turns white. I think it's just how, I mean, I don't know, Dave, how does no, that I can help you. Uh -huh. it's because I can help you, Joanna. It's because of the scattering of the light. Okay. Same thing with the cloud white makes uh, all foams white is that you're scattering. Here you're scattering the light from the air bubbles. And, oh, huge number of air bubbles with the light scattering all over the place and all the colors of the light scatter so it looks white. The yellow color is just because there's a little bit of absorption of the light that you see just some colors taken out so it looks yellow. Got it. Got it. But you were right. <laughs> I really like Joanne's explanation with the foam on the waves. That's perfect. I'm going to use that. Um, next question is from Julia, who is wondering if the different type of sugar, if it's light or dark brown or white, if that impacts the, ba the baked item and how you account for that. So um, light and brown sugar, light and dark brown sugar uh, are simply white sugar with some molasses added in. So if you are baking with brown sugar, whether light or dark, um, you just need to recognize that there is actually uh, molasses in the brown sugar, which is an acid. Molasses is an acid. And that means that when you're baking with it, um, if you add baking soda to your cake or your cookie, um, baking soda reacts with acid. So the baking soda will react with the brown sugar and that causes, um, that causes more bubbles. And so that also helps a cake become lighter or a cookie become fluffier. So here we have a question from Shubham who heard the last class, the, the previous lecture by Harold. And uh, he's wondering when you caramelize sugar, is it completely caramelized or some of it, is some of it also pyrolyzed as Harold ma mentioned? Dave, you're gonna have to help me with that one. <laughs> I don't know what pyrolyzed is. I think it's uh, it, it's uh, a, a reaction that's uh, uh, where it's burnt a little bit more than the uh, Maillard reaction, I think. Oh. But there was all kinds of reactions that Harold talked about. So my guess is that there's always some of that that's happening, but it's mainly Maillard reaction and caramelized. I would imagine the same thing. I think that when you take caramel, I mean, you can take caramel so, f so you can really take it really far. You know, I took it very, very light here so that it's just very pale, um, but you can keep it going until it turns black and even smokes. So I'd imagine the, the py pyrolization probably comes into play more there. Yeah. That sounds right to me too. Um, a question from Anne, who is thinking about adding salt when they create egg white foams um, and, and the effect it has and, and um, why they do it and does it stabilize it? And what are your thoughts on that? You know, the only thing that I can think that salt would do, besides obviously adding a little bit of flavor, is I, I think salt helps loosen up the, um, the egg white proteins. And so if you add a little bit of salt, it just makes the proteins a little bit relaxed so that they are more easily form um, the bonds which create the bubbles. I mean, when you're working with egg whites, um, it's sort of like working with sugar. There's so many things that can go wrong, and so you're always trying to uh, do everything you can to minimize the chance of things going wrong. And so adding a little bit of salt, I, I believe that works to relax the protein structures, which then will allow you to create more egg foams. Yeah, I, li I, I like that. It sort of denatures the proteins just a little bit and kind of helps them wrap around the, the bubbles. Yes. So uh, the... The way the sugar really stabilized the foam was amazing. And here's a question from Bonnie Huang, who asked, does sugar also stabilize whipped cream in the same way that it does for 
egg whites? I don't think it does. Um, you know, we actually, we use a lot of whipped cream at flour uh, and we sweeten it with a little bit of sugar, um, but it tends to still kind of, it'll collapse after a while. So I don't think the sugar does the same thing with whipped cream. And in fact, when we need to stabilize whipped cream, we actually add in a little bit of cornstarch because the cornstarch absorbs the moisture. Um, so I think it's a different, uh, a different kind of, I mean, with whipped cream, you're doing the same thing in that you're creating lots and lots of air bubbles. But for whatever reason, I, I think the sugar, there's so much fat in whipped cream that I don't know that the sugar is reacting with the liquid that's in the cream and able to do the same thing that it does with the egg whites. Um, so when you make the whipped cream, do you use uh, the things that you shake and you spray or do you mix it? No, we mix it. We take heavy cream into a bowl and we whip it. Um, yeah. And we add sugar to it to sweeten it. But if you leave it in the fridge, it will separate out. Sort of like the, you know, the egg whites, it it's, does the same thing. The, the whipped cream stays kind of firm on top and then the liquid comes out. And that's a really great question because I'd never actually thought about that. And I'm guessing because it is um, fat, because the cream is creating these air bubbles, but they're created by fat maybe the sugar doesn't have the same packing peanuts effect on the, the air bubbles of the whipped cream. That's what I'm guessing. So Joanne, we've had this discussion before. I think that it, you're changing the viscosity of the fluid and cornstarch changes the viscosity of the uh, milk, but the sugar changes the viscosity of the eggs. And so it's really just drainage. The fluid yeah. is slowly draining and you make the fluid more and more viscous, the drainage takes longer and longer. Cool. Cool. Do you have energy for one more question? Of course. Okay. So Jennifer Shu is wondering, um, when you create new recipes for books, do you start with a basic recipe and modify, or how do you go about your experimentation as you do it? Definitely the former. We start with a basic recipe. Um, we'll try two to three different recipes. We will you know, grab something from the internet, we'll grab something from one of our recipe books, we'll grab something from somebody at home, one of the bakers will bring in something from home, um, and we'll make all of these different variations. And then we, we do tastings every week um, where we get this big spread of food and we try everything. Uh, and if we're developing a new recipe, we'll try three to four different versions of that recipe. And then based on how these recipes come out, we're able to tweak to get to where we want. And so we might, try a, you know, a new cake and say, well, I really like the, the texture of this one, but I love the flavor of this one and the appearance of that one. Um, and then we kind of put them all together. We, we know enough about kind of the impact of sugar and eggs and flour and the leaveners and all of those things to kind of start to guesstimate how we can build our own recipe. Um, but there's certainly a huge amount of trial and error that comes into play. Joanne, we have two questions about the same thing, one from Zing and one from uh, Emily. They're wondering what does cream of tartar do to egg white and sugar mixture for making a meringue? So cream of tartar, uh, when you add it to egg whites, um, when you're making meringue, it's, it's supposed to stabilize the meringue. Again, when you're making um, egg whites or when you're making cooking sugar, you're trying to everything you can to, to try to make sure that you get all of the bubbles and to get the sugar to caramelize properly. And the cream of tartar does um, the same thing with both. It just adds a little extra um, assurance that your eggs will act, the egg whites will actually, uh, the foams will, will be nice and foamy and that the, sh the sugar will caramelize without crystallizing. Um, I don't know specifically what the cream of tartar does um, in order to cause that. I know that cream of tartar is an acid, so I think it's similar to, you know, sometimes you add a little bit of lemon juice when you're making, um, when you're caramelizing sugar as well. And I think the acid probably just helps stabilize um, the mixture. That's what I'm guessing. So often charges will keep the um, uh, layers between the bubbles stable, keep them further apart, and keep the, it'll, it'll prevent the fluid from draining. It's all about preventing drainage. Cool. 
Okay, cool. I have the feeling we could stay here all night and that questions keep coming in. Um, but maybe in, in the interest of time, we should officially wrap up here. What do you, what do you guys say? Um, sure. But I do encourage everyone who is still here to go to the little chat icon and um, maybe um, try one of these hands-on kits at home um, and check those out. And we'll be back next week. Next week, we'll be joined by the team from Mugaritz in Spain. They're going to talk all about fermentation. Um, but I hope this inspired you to um, bake. And I can tell just from the questions that you guys are all bakers. You're like thinking you like bakers. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us. And let's thank Joanne virtually one more time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, all you Joanne. I love teaching. Great, class. as always. Thank you. Thank you.